Hello and welcome to the best part of the week where we take an adventure across the universe. And even though you might be listening on the 1st of April, that is no April Fool's Day prank. It's really happening. We are searching through the solar system in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you for being there this week on the greatest podcast in the history of everything, everywhere. We will chat to Shinny Samara, an engineering expert. They've got a brand new book out, Engineers Making a Difference. They can tell us about some incredible people who have made stuff. The book has been generously supported by Imperial College London and the Gatsby Foundation. And they are ensuring that a couple of copies are donated for free to every single secondary state school in the UK. And we'll take a trip to Deep Space High to look down on the red planet and find out what a Mars rover does. Today I want us to think about some of the things that robot designers will need to take into account. Like what colour to paint it? Stripes or spots? (laughs) And I've got your questions to answer this week. They're about hyenas and the monarch butterfly. It's coming up in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's start with your science in the news. Last week, in a rare event, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, Uranus, Mars and the Moon were all visible at the same time in a line across the night sky. It's called a planetary parade. It's amazing, isn't it? that we are hurtling around the sun, all the planets are doing the same thing at different speeds, the moon's spinning around us, yet there comes moments where everything lines up perfectly in a planetary parade. Fantastic. Also, scientists in Australia have found evidence of a brand new creature. They've discovered fossils of a marsupial, which is like a koala or a kangaroo, and this one roamed across the continent 25 million years ago. They think it's a cross between a wombat and a marsupial lion, and it might have weighed up to 50 kilograms. Brilliant, isn't it, that we're still discovering things out there in space and looking back in the past, too. And the birth of a monkey at a zoo in Cornwall has been called a success for a vulnerable species. The white-throated capuchin monkey has been born in Nuki Zoo. It was at the start of March. Now, this is fantastic. There aren't that many left in the wild due to hunting and their homes, habitats being destroyed. Now, they're known to be a very smart species. They're normally in South America and they can even make tools. So the more of them, the better. It's time to spin the big wheel then. It's another episode of the A to Z of Engineering. For the last few weeks, we have been learning all about everything that happens in engineering, the brilliant world there, how things are designed, created and fixed. And we've been going right the way through the alphabet from A to Z, learning from acoustics all the way through to zoos. Uh, To find out which letter we're learning about this week, we need to spin that big wheel with Engers, our engineering expert. Hello and welcome to another Engineering Academy, where we're exploring an A to Z of everything engineering. Let's spin the wheel and see where we're engineering today. Over to Engers to spin the wheel. It's I and I is for insulation. Thanks, Engers. Now, when you hear the word insulation, you might think about loft and wall insulation in our homes. But there's a lot more to insulation than that. It's the act of covering something to stop heat, sound, or electricity from escaping. So it's something that touches almost every part of our lives. Let's find out more with Engers. Let's start with heat insulation. You're right that it's something we use to keep our homes and schools warm. Loft and wall insulation, which is usually made of mineral wool or glass fibre, traps air in pockets in the fibre, whilst double glazing is engineered to prevent heat from travelling between the glass panes. They're simple barriers, but the materials used can be very high-tech to maximise the heat retained. The clever thing is that the very same principles of air pockets and barriers can be used when it's hot to do the opposite. Keep heat outside from travelling inside, reducing the need for things like fans and air conditioning. And the same principle of creating air pockets is used in the clothing we wear. We know that a puffer jacket will be warmer than a t-shirt because it has lots of spaces between the fibres in the padding which trap our body heat to keep us snug. 
Things like ovens also use barriers to ensure that heat doesn't escape. They use rubber seals to ensure doors fit snugly. And seals are also found in another type of insulation, when we want things to remain cold, like our fridges and freezers. Next up, let's hear it for sound insulation. If you have a neighbour who loves their drum kit, you'll know sound is very good at travelling, even through brick walls. Engineers have designed a wide range of materials that can be used to create sound barriers. And it's technology that's also used in factories and around roadworks, where noise levels might even be dangerous. The last type of insulation we're looking at is electrical insulation, which uses materials in a different way to keep us safe. Preventing electricity from travelling to unwanted places isn't just helpful, it's vital to prevent electric shocks or death. Whether it's the circuits in our mobile phones, kitchen appliances, or the pylons and substations that carry electricity around, insulating materials like rubber, porcelain, ceramics, glass, and even plastics help keep electricity safe. Because of their chemical makeup, these materials don't let electricity pass through easily. Let's have a look at some super cool new innovations in insulation engineering. Whether for sport, outdoor pursuits or work that needs to be done in freezing conditions, clothing companies have always been looking for new ways to improve the insulation properties of their clothes. Some are developing intelligent insulation, fabrics that expand or contract in response to temperature changes. As temperatures drop, the fabrics contract and bend to create channels in their structure to increase the amount of insulation. Pretty clever, huh? Some engineers are developing technology that sucks the heat out of buildings to keep them cool. They've created cooling paper, which uses the porous microstructure of the fibres inside the paper to absorb warmth and direct it away. Their idea was sparked after seeing a waste bin of printing paper. Using a kitchen blender, they turned the waste paper into a pulp mixed it with materials that make up Teflon and used it to coat the outside of buildings. Clever and energy efficient too. Thanks, Engers. And that's our take on the letter I. It's been inspiring. If you'd like to check out some other types of engineering, why not check out ION, Imaging or Industrial Engineering? Engineer Academy, created with support from the Royal Academy of Engineering. If you would like to find out more about the A to Z, visit funkislive.com slash engineer. It's time for your questions then. Remember, if you have got anything sciencey that you want answered on the show, if you would like me to do the digging, the detective work for you, the best way is to get to funkidslive.com, find the Science Weekly page there and leave it as a voice note so I can listen, say hello and then find out the answer. Very quickly before we get into the questions, I want to say hello to Marley from Mozambique. Marley, you're always getting in touch with the show And I really thank you for listening over there and sending me so many brilliant questions. Well, they listened to an episode recently when we talked about Cyclone Freddy. This was a big tropical storm that uh, moved across Africa and it closed Marley's school for a week. They've had many floods since. It's quite incredible, isn't it? The things that we talk about on this show, how they do have an impact on people, on us in the world. So, Marley, thank you for listening and I hope you're staying safe. All right. Let's get our first question underway. This was sent in uh, through Apple Podcasts. Lavender in Trinidad left us a review there. They want to know why do hyenas make a laughing noise? Well, laughing in hyenas is a form of communication. Like you and me, we might talk, we might laugh as well to let people know we find things funny we might cry when we're sad in hyenas it means that they are excited or annoyed or even scared it kind of does everything here's what's amazing there are lots of different species of hyenas only one of them the spotted hyena makes the laughing sound that they're known for we think every we think all of them do it but it's only that one species the spotted hyena that that one sound can mean so much for them too. It could mean that one of the pack has a fresh kill. Maybe it's the sound of a small hyena that wants some food. Maybe it's the cackling of an older hyena that says, wait your turn, little one, this is my meal. Uh, all those different things are shown in just that one noise, laughing. 
It's amazing how wildlife and nature works like that, isn't it? Thank you so much to Lavender in Trinidad. Let's get a question then sent in as a voice note at funkidslife.com. Hello, my name is Amber and I am six years old. My question is, how does the toxic butterfly not get sick when it eats the plant? Amber, thank you so much for your question. I think you're talking about the monarch butterfly. Uh, That was one of our stars of the show. It was a dangerous Dan a few weeks ago, wasn't it? And it was a dangerous Dan because it eats milkweed, which is a toxic plant, and it uses the poison from the plant to harm their prey so they can then eat it. Well, sometimes the butterfly, when it's a caterpillar, does get sick from the milkweed. So they've got a few ways of getting around the poison. First, the caterpillar will shave off all of the hairy bits of the milkweed leaves. They make it very tough to eat. When the hairs are out of the way, they make a little hole right in the middle of the leaf. It's because it's covered in a sticky material called latex. And that can easy, easily stick the caterpillar down to the leaf so it can never move. So it needs to get that out of the way by making a hole in the middle. All of that latex drains off. Now it's clear so it can actually tuck in. And what the monarch butterfly caterpillar does is it eats all that it can, really, before it thinks it might get sick. Sometimes it ends up eating too much and then it is sick from all the poison. Sometimes it eats just enough that it's not feeling rough and it's got that toxic to then go and have food itself when it's a butterfly. Now, this is a huge evolutionary battle that goes on two species warring to win. The butterfly needs the milkweed poison so it can eat. The milkweed wants to poison the other butterfly so it doesn't get eaten so it can stay alive. Sometimes the butterfly wins and other times the plant wins. Amber, thank you so much for that question. If you have something that you want answered on this very podcast, get to funkidslive.com or you can do it on the free Fun Kids app. Find the Science Weekly page and send a voice note there. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, where we look at some of the most mean, cruel, wicked and amazing things in the world. This week, we're looking at a tiny, feisty creature with a very strange way of defending itself. You'll find the regal horned lizard in the United States and just below in Mexico. They scurry around rocky deserts, weaving between cacti and dry mountains. They only grow to about four inches long. It's not big. It could probably fit in your hand. Now, they're quite a slow runner. And they use their greenish, tanned, coloured body to blend in and to camouflage so they can escape. They do look mean, though. Think of the name, the regal horned lizard. They're covered in spikes from the top of its head all the way down to its tail. They feast on ants and they can eat almost 3,000 of them in one meal. And here is the most incredible thing about the regal horned lizard. It's what puts them on this dangerous Dan list. It's something that I've never heard about in the wild before. When this lizard is threatened, when it needs to make an escape from a big predator, get a load of this, it shoots blood from its eyes. The blood, the red stuff, is kept in a chamber in the back of its head where it bubbles away and it heats up. And when it's needed, when it needs to stun, to temporarily blind a predator, to make a quick getaway, it shoots blood straight from its eyes. How amazing is that? How brilliant can wildlife be? So it may be small, but it's spiky. And any animal that shoots blood from its eyes, like the regal horned lizard, goes straight onto our dangerous Dan list. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This week, we're talking all about engineers with Dr. Shini Samara, who's got a brand new book out. It's called Engineers Making a Difference. Shini, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks, Dan, for having me on the show. So exciting. Now, you've been on telly talking about engineers and engineering and some fantastic things around science, and you've brought this new book out. Um, We've heard before a lot at school and on the show about engineers from the past, but your book is stuffed full of engineers doing work right now. Where did you find them all from? How was your research? Well, I'm an engineer myself. I studied mechanical engineering and I was in industry for a few years. And so I met some fantastic engineers um, whilst I was doing the engineering myself. But since then, I've been working in television, making films about incredible innovations and technology and science. And so I've been around a lot of really inspiring and interesting engineers and scientists and technologists for a while. So pooling them all together, you know, the problem I had with 
grouping them for this book was who to not include. I just know so many fantastic people that it was a struggle to get the numbers down to 46. And so uh, even though the book has, you know, a handful of really, really interesting engineers in the book, there are also some amazing engineers out of the book as well. Now, when we think of engineers, we might think of someone that maybe fixes a car or just fixes things. But engineers do so much more. So just tell us about you and your history with engineering and how you work in the field. You're absolutely right. When people say the word engineer or engineering, I mean, what what springs to your mind? To most people, it's things like hard hats, fluorescent jackets. Maybe they're wearing greasy overalls. They're rolling underneath a car. And engineering is all those things, but it's also so much more than that. When I was in engineering, I was working on some really cutting edge stuff, like really pioneering the latest advanced technology of engineering. I was working on something called fluid dynamics, which is computational fluid dynamics is the software that allows engineers to visualize what's normally invisible to us. So on a computer screen, you could see exactly how a fluid like air is behaving around an aircraft wing or a Formula One car. And being able to visualize how air behaves around machines is really useful to engineers because it means that they can design really aerodynamic machines and, and just make better designs overall. So what I was working on was so advanced and so complex, and it was nothing like what most people think engineers do. Um, and it's not that the engineering I was doing was better than other engineering, but it just showed me how varied engineering can be. The word engineering encompasses so much, you know, it, and I've got 12 chapters in my book where um, I talk about transportation and I talk about going beyond food, robotics. I mean, engineering just covers so many different areas of our lives. So my experience of engineering is that there is a lot going on in engineering and engineers can do so many different things, but something ties us all together. It unites all of us. And that is that engineers love to solve problems. They love to find solutions to challenges and um, they're usually really creative they love to be build things and design things. So engineers are usually um, not only creative, but technical. They're just, engineers are awesome. <laughs> you told us that it was really tough to leave some fabulous engineers out of the book, but there are so many stuffed into it. Just tell us about some of the fantastic engineers that we can learn about in the book. Oh, uh, well, you know, I don't have any favourites because I honestly think that every single one of the engineers in the book just are amazing in their own right. And they're doing such contrasting and different things. I'll tell you about the first engineer that you'll meet in the book, kind of page one sort of thing. And that is Navjot Sawney. He is an engineer that was working on designing better vacuum cleaners. And he got really frustrated that he was using his engineering skills to make engineering for people that already were surrounded by a lot of fantastic machinery and devices. So he actually took some time out, moved to India for about 18 months and um, started making cook stoves that ran on solar power. And while he was there, he got inspired to make a washing machine that doesn't run on electricity because there are some parts of the world where people don't have electricity Imagine that they don't have in their homes an ability to just plug in the charges for their phones or, you know, to switch on a light whenever they want. Some people aren't as lucky as we are in the West. And so he designed a washing machine that didn't need to use electricity, but was actually powered by a hand crank. So by turning a lever, you could actually wash your clothes. And he designed all of that from scratch. His machines, washing machines, are now used in parts of the world that don't necessarily have a lot of water and a lot of electricity. So he was solving the problem of providing clean clothes to people that don't have 
the kinds of resources that we have readily available to us. So that's one engineer. Um, but there are other engineers who, for example, have designed and built together with teams of engineers, satellites that go into space and help us with our communication, probes and detectors that are, as we speak, kind of finding more about the other planets in our solar system, like Saturn and Jupiter. Recently, with the terrible earthquakes that happened in Turkey and Syria, there's actually an earthquake engineer in the book who designs solutions for making buildings um, stay standing in really strong earthquakes. So there's just so many different things. I, I, I would need an hour with you to tell you all the different kinds of engineering that there is. I know that they're all in the book and they are fantastic. And what's brilliant, there are ways that listeners can, can read this book without buying it. Is that right? They're kind of some going into schools, I think. Yes. So the book has been generously supported by Imperial College London and the Gatsby Foundation. And they are ensuring that a couple of copies are donated for free to every single secondary state school in the UK which is something like over 8,000 books will be available to students in secondary schools. And those books also come in a package of 12 posters that are basically blown up images and information from the 12 chapters in my book. And there's also a timeline and there are teaching resources and activities for the classroom. So it's a real sort of schools pack, which goes out. But you can also buy the book wherever you usually get your books as well, if you're curious to have a copy for yourself. It's called Engineers Making a Difference by Dr. Shilly Samara. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Right. I hope you strapped yourself in. Just before we leave this episode, we need to, well, leave planet Earth, really. We're taking a trip to Deep Space High, the smartest school in the solar system. We're catching up, getting a lesson with Professor Pulsar, who's been here for the last mm, couple of months or so, really, teaching us all about space, the universe, every galaxy and everything in between. This series, it's all about Mars, the red planet. And today you can help the class. They're starting to think about how to design an ExoMars rover. It'll need to be able to withstand the conditions on Mars. And Mars can be a tough place. Deep Space High, Destination Mars. Now, as we've been finding out, Earth scientists have some very exciting plans to send robots to Mars. And astronauts. Well, later on. Yes, that's right. Robots will go first. Designing robots for Mars is a big job. So today I want us to think about some of the things that robot designers will need to take into account. Like what colour to paint it? Stripes or spots? <laughs> there are some other more important things to think about, Quark. The ExoMars key mission objective is to look for life or conditions for life. That's fossilised organic materials, right? And gases like methane, water or signs of water. Signs of swimming pools. Water slides. <laughs> I really don't think they're going to find swimming pools on Mars, but I suppose anything is possible. So, as you can see, Mars robots have got a lot of work to do, and they'll be all alone up there. So how is it going to communicate with Earth and tell us what it's found? Communication is going to be very important, right? This will be done with satellites, but because of the distance from Mars to Earth, it can be a bit tricky. Let's put that on the board. Communication. Now, what else will the designers of the rovers have to think about? Let's take a look at the planet again, see if that gives us any clues. Looks pretty chilly. You said it's much colder on Mars than on Earth. As much as minus 70 degrees at night. Oh, whatever the robot's made of, it will need to be able to work at those temperatures. It's also very dusty. That could cause problems for the instruments. That's right. And there's radiation too, which can be an issue. Let's group those things together. Managing in the environment. And think about the very delicate gadgets and computer technology that the robot will use. That could be quite a challenge. Can't someone just knit it a lovely woolly jumper to keep it warm? Well, we'll find out more about how they plan on keeping them warm and dust-free in our next lesson. So, what else will be a design challenge? 
Look at the terrain again. Well, if I was trying to get across a rocky desert like that, I'd need a vehicle with really tough wheels. You don't want a flat tyre out there. Getting around is going to be a big challenge. Exactly. Getting around. That's a problem in itself. You wouldn't be able to call them a recovery truck if the robot's wheels were damaged, so the design has to be very tough. Navigation is also something to think about. The robot needs to choose its own route rather than waiting for commands from Earth. That's because of the time delay in sending signals to Mars from Earth and also because the rover will have a better view of what's around it and any obstacles. So how are they going to power it up? There aren't any petrol stations up there. Well, not unless they're very well hidden. <laughs> well done, Sam. That's another factor for the designers to think about. Powering the rover. You can't take power sources to Mars. They'd be too bulky and possibly dangerous. So solar panels will be the way to power the robots. But there's another problem that designers will have to think about before any of these. Think about how the rover will get to the surface. Landing? Yeah, I suppose they need to get that right or there's no point worrying about anything else. Landing the rover. Exactly. Earthlings have sent over 40 missions to Mars to date and more than 50% of them have ended in failure. Problems in landing account for most of these failures. And you can imagine how devastating that is after all the work done. To crash land before a rover has even taken one roll of its wheels? That's sad. I think landing the rover might be the most important problem of all. Well, as you can see, there are a lot of things to think about before you even start building a rover. In our next few lessons, we'll see scientists tackle some of the problems when we go down to the robotics lab. Deep Space High, Destination Mars. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. And that is it for this week's episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you have enjoyed the podcast and you would love a question answered on the show, make sure you leave it as a voice note over at funkidslive.com. You can also open up the free Fun Kids app and drop a voice recording over there. Leave your name so I can say hello and a question will really help me actually answer it, won't it? While you're on the free Fun Kids app, you can hear so many of our brilliant podcast series there. You've heard a couple today. You can get those on Google, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your shows too and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen all over the country on your DAB digital radio and at funkidslive.com. <laughs> 